Wherever you are and wherever you're at on your spiritual journey to Jesus, please know that you're most welcome here and online to experience with us God's joy and God's hope and God's peace today. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Revelation, chapter 7. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was involved in Nazarene Pastor Day at the Capitol. We went and had a, a meeting first at a church near the Iowa State Capitol, and then uh, met for an hour, talked about some things, and prayed with a bunch of other Nazarene pastors and the people that are involved in this ministry that ministers at the State Capitol. And then we walked to the Capitol and uh, tried to meet with different people that work at the Capitol. Got to, I got to pray with a senator. And uh, it was pretty neat being able to do that. Uh, didn't make a name for myself because I don't know that the center would even recognize me again if he met me. But uh, we're making a name for Jesus. Amen, that's right. And uh, it's an opportunity to pray. I don't even know if, what the guy's political standing is. I just know that he uh, works in the Iowa government. And uh, we're supposed to pray for our leaders, right? Amen. Amen. But I like something they said to us before we went over. He said, we aren't there, the guy leading us and talking to us, um, he was um, in this ministry that does this. He says, uh, we're going over there, we don't discuss politics. We are over there, we are not Republican, we are not Democrat. He said, we're not even bipartisan, because bipartisan means you need to make both sides happy. He said, we are nonpartisan, because when we go, we are representing the kingdom that is bigger and better than any kingdom this world has ever seen. Amen. Amen. So as Christians, we need to remember that we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom first and foremost. This reminds me of uh, this. There's a show on PBS. You ever watch it? Rick Steves. He goes over to Europe. I think that's how you say his name. Rick Steves. Uh, Rick, Stevens. Rick Stevens. That's his name. And uh, I was flipping through one day, and he was in Scotland. And that attracted my interest because, you know, my uh, part of my family comes over from Scotland. I was watching it. And he was talking to this guy over there in Scotland. He says, well, here in Scotland, you're part of, uh, you're Scottish, but you're also part of the, uh, you know, the UK. So are you Scottish or a British citizen second, you know, first, you know, which is first? He says, I'm Scottish first. And he says, okay, so you're a UK citizen second. He goes, no, I'm Scottish second. <laughs> he was first, second, all the way down. He was Scottish through and through, he said. And uh, I think as, as representatives and, and ambassadors of a heavenly kingdom, that should be our attitude as well. We are first and foremost Christian. We are secondly Christian. Thirdly, Christian ambassadors of a kingdom and that is where our citizenship lies first and foremost above everything else and so uh, when we forget that and try to live for this world we're forgetting that we weren't made for this world Amen. we were born again for a better world so i want to talk today about that better world i often say that we are born again we are saved not just in the hereafter, but also the here and now. God makes a difference in our lives today. We're born again today. The kingdom of heaven can come down and change things today. We aren't just living for some day far off. We're living to see God move today. Amen? Amen. However, there will be a day when we shall see his face. And what a glorious day that will be. Yeah. One day we're going to be at a homecoming. That's better than any other homecoming we can ever have. Crazy. And you might ask, well, what does this have to do with Lent? What does this have to do with Easter, with the crucifixion, resurrection? Well, at the Last Supper, Jesus brings it up. He's having uh, the Passover with his disciples and he tells them, I won't participate in this until that wedding feast on that day. 
Do this in remembrance of me. We have that on the, on the front of the, of the table here. We set the communion elements upon. We do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. And uh, he's not doing it. He's not partaking of communion again until that day. And so he was being crucified. He's talking about going to the cross. He was having that last supper with his disciples. But his focus was on that day. He went to the cross and scorned its shame, defeated death and hell and the grave because one day everything will be put under his feet. And we look forward to that day. And that's what Easter, that's what Lent is about. It's not just focusing on, you know, it starts with Ash Wednesday where we remember we are just dust. We were made from dirt. We are temporary. We are not going to live forever. One day we're all going to die should the Lord tarry, right? One day we're going to leave this earth and so we remember that at Ash Wednesday. But as part of that, one day we're going to leave. One day we're going to be home. One day we're going to be entering through those pearly gates, walking those streets of gold. One day we're going to meet Jesus. Praise the Lord. And we look ahead to that. We rise our head above all of the troubles of this life and look ahead to what's waiting for us. I, uh, I know a, a man who, this was years back, he worked for the, the post office. And he was really focused on retirement. He set aside all of his money. He just scripted and saved and, and lived cheaply so he could set all of his money for his retirement. And he was really looking forward to it. And they had a big party for him on his retirement day. And the next week he passed. He didn't even get to enjoy his retirement. We can make all of our plans. But it doesn't mean we're going to see all of those plans. And we need to remember that we don't live for here. We live for our eternal retirement. <clears throat> Store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not. The government can come and take all of our retirement funds someday. They, we don't know what they're going to do. We, we wouldn't be surprised, would we? They, they like to do things that doesn't make a lot of sense. But one day, we'll be home. You won't have to worry about them messing things up. So, who's looking forward to that day? Oh, yeah, okay, got a couple of people looking forward to that day. I just thought we'd have more people looking forward to heaven. All right. So, oh, oh, you have another one. Hallelujah, I see that hand. All right. Uh, let's read in Revelation chapter 7. Let's start in verse 9. After this, I looked, and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands. So symbolic again of that Palm Sunday, which we'll be celebrating. They cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell face down before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. Amen. Then one of the elders said to me, Who are these people wearing white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he said to me, These people have come out of great hardship. They have washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them. 
because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Praise the Lord. Again, who looks forward to that day? Amen. Got a, got a few more that time. We're excited at the idea of being home. Amen. The homecoming that we're going to have one day will be more than a family reunion. Ever have family get-togethers? They can be a little stressful. Making all that food. Getting prepared for all the people coming to your house if you're hosting it. Families that are there, family people that are there that don't always get along. But one day, we're going to be up there, and it's going to be a celebration. It's going to be a good homecoming, a good family reunion, because we'll be part of the family of God. Amen. So for a couple points I'd like to make today. First of all, heaven is real. Amen. Heaven is real. I have personally held hands and prayed with so many people as they passed on. Often I'll read scripture, like Psalm 23 or Romans chapter 8. I'll read pastor scripture with them and, and pray with them. And I've held their hands as they passed. When they are right with God, it's a glorious thing. One woman I remember, I was holding her hands and she started talking to Jesus. Like she could see him in the room. And she went home. I've heard a lot of pastors, different people talking about being in the room when people who aren't right with God pass on. And how it's a very different experience. Mm -hmm. There's a, I, I forgot to write it down. There was, uh, I was reading a couple months back a story of this great famous person in our history who was a devout atheist. And I was talking about the day he died. And I can't remember exactly how he put it. There's a lot of stories like that where he's passing away and he starts screaming about how much it burns. But there are so many who are right with God that when they go home, it's a glorious homecoming. I think I'd rather be right with God, don't you? Amen. Heaven is real. It's talked about in, in Scripture. There were even people who were religious in Jesus' day who had trouble believing in heaven. Uh, the Sadducees had trouble believing in the afterlife. And, uh, you know, they had some different beliefs. And so Jesus was very clear. In the Bible, there are 531 references to heaven. It is never presented as just this imaginary, abstract idea, but a literal place where one day we will go home. One day we will be there. Have you ever noticed that the rest of the world, even non-Christians, believe in heaven? I remember as a kid seeing a cartoon movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Even non-believers out there, they'll, they'll talk about heaven. Their idea of what it takes to get there is way messed up. They believe good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell, and that's not biblical at all. Just because someone's a good person doesn't mean they're going to make it to heaven. Because nobody is good except God alone. We are saved not by our good works or being good as the world deems goodness. We are saved by Jesus Christ. However, if you look in the world, there is this idea of heaven and hell. Even among those who are not believers. Even skeptics have trouble explaining why this concept of heaven is so universal. 
Even in other religions, they, they understand that there's something there that they're living towards. They just don't understand how to get there. That's what I want to talk about now is, first of all, heaven is real. And secondly, there is a road to heaven. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Do we believe that? That is at the core of Christianity. You cannot be a Christian and believe there are many roads to heaven. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And unless we believe that, then we should, if we don't, then we should take the name church off the outside because we are not Christians. Christianity requires that Jesus is the only way. There are some false Christianity beliefs out there that try to water that down. Uh, my wife, Carrie and I, we just uh, ran across this, I think it might have been Friday night. We were talking about some of the people from our past. We brought up this one gentleman back when I was in Red Oak, who, uh, I, in the time I was there, he started coming and he was from some different backgrounds and he was looking at um, becoming a Nazarene pastor for a bit. But it, there were problems because he was sending me emails every Sunday about things I said in my sermons that he disagreed with. And so he was very hostile. And I put my foot down when he started attacking the, the people in the church as well. Our Sunday school teachers and our, our people in the church. And uh, he left. I wasn't going to put up with it. And one of his problems is he, he thought I wasn't evangelical enough. I wasn't Christian enough. Because in the Nazarene church, we, we have people from different theological backgrounds, right? That's why we, we have it open if you're, to be baptized. Uh, we don't demand that you be immersed. We open it up to, you know, being, if you're uh, like in the hospital, someone's on their deathbed, I'm not going to try to pull them up and put them in a bathtub and, and force them to immerse them to baptize them. You know, I'll, I'll sprinkle water on their head or, or pour water on their head. You know, we, we have it open. There's different things that we are open like that on. Uh, in times, we're in Revelation. We don't take a stance on uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-mill, amill, because our, we started with people from that believed in holiness from uh, church denominations that believe pre-mill and post-mill and different beliefs on that. And we decided as a denomination that, uh, you know, that's not a salvation issue. You can be have a pre-mill view or a post-mill view and still make it to heaven. What matters is, do we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior? So, you know, as a denomination, we, we try to take some middle ground in some of those areas that are not black and white issues. And because of that, he attacked me. And so it was ironic that we looked him up and he used to attack me for not being conservative enough. But now he's got articles in the Des Moines Register and other things telling about how he moved from evangelical Christianity to a very woke, progressive beliefs. So it was ironic to me. He now is part of uh, a denomination, a universalist denomination that does not believe in the Bible. They don't believe in a, a literal God, rather the God is a feeling. They call themselves Christian, but they are not orthodox. They do not stand on the truth of God's word. So they are not Christian. The world tries to redefine who Jesus is. We don't get to do that. Jesus gets to define our beliefs. Jesus gets to define what we're going to stand on. Everything in Christianity must hinge on Jesus. Or we have nothing. There is a road to heaven. And it is only through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Right? Right? 
In Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that the Father raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's about Jesus. It's not a good people, bad people thing. It's a Jesus thing. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. Good people will go to hell. And bad people who have turned to Jesus will go to heaven. It's called grace. That's the message of grace. That's the message of Jesus Christ. Because if everybody that considers himself a good person is going to heaven, then Jesus wasted his time dying on a cross. Because evidently we don't need him. But that's not true. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And it's also more than just empty lip service calling him Lord. It says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, Father raised him from the dead, he'll be saved. It's more than just that empty lip service of calling him Lord. Because Jesus himself said, many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, and will not go to heaven. Because Jesus never knew them. Heaven is for those who have settled the question of who is their Lord. Who has lordship over their lives. If I am going to have lordship over my own life, then I am not right with God. He must be my Lord. He must be my Savior. Now when this was written... We need to understand that the Bible uses these idea, ideas of kings and lords and kingdoms because the people in that day, they would understand the concept. Today, we don't, we don't have that. We have a president, we have Senate and Congress here in the United States, and uh, we don't deal with that like they did back then. I see movies and, and I read stories of these knights, and they would swear loyalty to their king or to their lord. And they would follow a code of honor where they would give their life for their king or for their lord. And so that was the idea. When we say Jesus is my lord, it was an empty lip service. We are pledging our fealty. We are pledging our, our loyalty, our, our code of honor to him that we would take up our cross for our king. He must be our Lord. Jesus talks a lot. There are a lot of passages in scripture. And Jesus talks about a lot. About who will go to heaven. And you know we lost one hour of sleep. Due to daylight savings time here in the U.S. So I'm not going to go into all the passages talking about who will get to heaven and who won't. But there, just to touch on a few things, Jesus talks about those who are invited are the family of God. God's children are invited. One of the lies in our culture today is that we're all God's children. It's not true. Nowhere in scripture does it say we are all God's children. Have you heard people say that? It's not true. That's one of those things that the enemy has twisted into people thinking all good people go to heaven. We're all God's children. No. Jesus himself pointed out to the religious leaders of his day that they were children of Satan. There are people who are children of God and people that are children of hell. Children of Satan. We need to understand that. And not be afraid to preach it. Because there are too many wishy-washy, candy-coated, feel-good preachers out there who won't preach the truth that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And not everybody who thinks they're right with God is going to make it to heaven. 
Jesus said that there was going to be some up there that are going to be surprised when they get to that day and find out that they didn't actually have Jesus as their Lord. I want to be on the right side of that. Jesus talks about white robes. <laughs> he talks about us being wearing appropriate clothing for the wedding banquet. He gives a, uh, a parable about that. And people that weren't dressed appropriately get kicked out of that feast. And, and they go to where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And John here in, in Revelation, he mentions that. Verse 9, after this I looked and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands. They wore white robes. You know, in those days, uh, clothes got pretty dirty. They didn't have Tide. They didn't have washing machines. They didn't have street cleaning services. There were a lot of animals out in the road. We go to a parade nowadays and the horses are always at the end, right? Because they leave messes in the road. In those days, the roads were filled with animals. And you just had to watch your step. White robes in that society didn't really mesh well. However, God will give us white robes and he will keep us clean. And we need to be dressed appropriately for that wedding feast. Amen. Notice also that there is no segregation. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. They're all gathered around the throne. Amen. All the people that love their neighbor. Politics should not be involved in whether or not we love our neighbor. We shouldn't worry over whether it's a Democrat thing or a Republican thing or a third party thing. What matters is we love one another. Politics have nothing to do with this. We are nonpartisan. We belong to Jesus Christ. And he told us to love one another, right? And listen to the joy of verse 10. They cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Victory in Jesus. They're excited. They're joyous. They aren't sitting there like some people do on Sundays. Like, uh, victory. They're excited. They're in the presence of God before His throne. They have reached their homecoming. They are celebrating. They are happy. We are going to experience that someday if we stay right with God. That's going to be awesome. We don't read anyone there who is bitter and unhappy. Everyone there has forgiven and let go. Everyone there has laid aside racial prejudices. Everyone there has decided they care more about people's souls than they do about people's nationality or bank account or anything else. That's going to be a great day because one day it's not going to be about politics anymore. We're going to be in the kingdom of God. And it won't be a matter of keeping up with the Joneses. Down here, because we won't care about possessions up there. The possessions we're happy with down here, oh, they're going to get destroyed one day. This world will be destroyed by fire. He's going to make a new heaven, a new earth. And it won't matter. All these things that people strive after today don't matter. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because there they will last. Live for a better kingdom. So these people that make it, they're people who went to the cross. Verse 14. He replies to John, says, These people have come out of great hardship. Anybody, anybody been there? 
come out of great hardship. They have washed their robes and made them white through their good works. Through the blood of the Lamb. Works better than Tide, works better than Borax, works better than anything. It's the only thing that's going to clean our souls is the blood of the Lamb. To make it there and to put on the robes, we need to go to the cross. Jesus is the way. We need to shout that, trumpet it, sing it loud and long. These people genuinely love God. And they're worshiping Him. Verse 12 saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. These are things that people chase after for themselves. They want blessings. People are like, I, 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 want, I want blessings. People want glory. They want that pat on the back. They want wisdom. They want people to think they're wise. They want thanksgiving. And honor. They want to be honored. They want power. So many church splits today over power struggles. Well, that happens when people have the power and not Jesus. And honor and power and might. People think they're so strong. Governments think they're so strong. They're nothing compared to God. He deserves all the praise and all the glory. So, heaven is real. There is a road to heaven. It is a narrow road. And it only goes through Jesus. And thirdly, the road will be narrow and difficult, but worth it. I, I, before Bill passed on, um, we went on some road trips with Bill, Bill and Terry and uh, went to Nashville and went to Pagosa Springs, Colorado. And on those trips, I drove a bit. It's my first experience at driving in the mountains. You know what? Not a fan. I also drove through St. Louis, a city I didn't know, watching for signs. And we got there at night when it was dark and rainy. You know what? Not a fan. I was not a fan of it. Did not enjoy it one little bit. However, when I think back on it, what I remember most was the destination. One day, when we get home, when we get up there, our destination, we'll forget about all the hardships, all the struggles on our road, on our road trip. We'll be home. Our homecoming will be worth the hardships of our road trip. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. We'll also be released from the bondage of our bodies. Verse 16. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them. That'll be great. He's writing to people that are more, you know, near the equator area, the desert area. So, so they understood the heat beating down on them. Now here we have winter and summer and we understand hot and cold and the varying temperatures. One day we won't have to worry about that anymore. One day we won't have to worry about going in the ditch. Because we slid off the road. One day, we're not going to worry about heat exhaustion or sunstroke. One day, we're going to be home. And we're going to take all of these earthly problems and lay them down. We won't be hungry. We won't be thirsty. We won't be overheated. We won't be cold. We'll be home. And it'll be great. In Philippians 3, it says our citizenship is in heaven. We look forward to a Savior that comes from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform our humble bodies so that they are like His glorious body. 
by the power that also makes him able to subject all things to himself. One day we're going to have a body like Jesus's body after he rose from the dead. If you read the Gospels lately about what Jesus did after he rose from the dead, he appeared in a locked room. He didn't need to eat or drink anymore. He had a body that was so much better than our bodies. One day we'll have a body like that. No more pain. No more suffering. I uh, Working at the store during the week, I swear the older I get, the harder it is for me to hop up after putting stuff on that bottom shelf. I, I get up and I, I'm like, man, I, I sound like a bowl of Rice Krispies and cereal. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm almost 48, so, you know, I got, you know, it's only, it's only going to get... It gets better. It, does it? It gets better? All right. I always know the feeling. So, you know, these bodies, they're a little breakdown on us. Some of our bodies break down quicker than others. We saw someone, we were at the nursing home this week, who's in her hundreds. Like a hundred, you thought, right, Terry? Yeah. That lady, uh, yeah. And, uh, and she, was, she was in a wheelchair, but she could stand up when she went in the wheelchair a little bit. And she was all gung-ho, and she was the loudest singer in our, in our hymn sing there. And, you know, she's 100, but she's excited. So, you know, our bodies, they break down at different rates. Some of us have sicknesses, diseases, cancers. We don't know what the future holds for each one of us. But we do know that one day we'll be able to lay all of that aside and we'll be doing somersaults down that gold street in heaven. It's going to be awesome. Amen. We'll have a body like his. He's going to also clear away all of our anxiety. Verse 17, because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. The lamb is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them. You know why we have so much anxiety? One of the reasons is because we are so worried. We have to be in control. One day, we won't need to be in control anymore. We won't even feel the need to be in control because we're going to trust Him so much. We're going to let Him lead. We're going to let Him make the decisions. All of the stress we put on ourselves, we're going to say, okay, God. And he tells us to do that today, but, you know, it's a struggle. We want to solve these problems. We want to deal with these problems. We get anxious as we're trying to figure out the best solution. And one day we won't have to. It also says he's going to take care of our grief. He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. He's going to wipe away all the pain. Are you carrying pain? Are you carrying heartache? Sorrow? One day... He's going to wipe it all away. And our relationship with him is going to be unending. Verse 15, this is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple, and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. We're going to be able to worship him day and night, not just a Sunday only. We're going to worship him, going to gather together and worship him and just have a great time. Be like the camp meetings of old, people running down the aisles. We're going to be excited. The presence of God is going to be there powerfully. And there isn't going to be any of this ho-hum. Praise the Lord. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. So what's the big idea for today? So the big idea I'd like us all to bring with us as, as we go out is that heaven will be glorious. And are we sure that we are right with God on the right road and that's where we are going? The Apostle Paul wrote these letters to Christian churches and told them, be careful, be mindful, 
The enemy is out there prowling. We can make the assumption that we're right with God when we're not. So today's message is part, it's going to be awesome, but it's also part, be careful, be mindful, be aware. Don't coast in your walk with Christ. Because our souls are on the line. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you, Lord, that you have saved us, that you have rescued us, and, and that, God, you are at work in our midst today. I just, it's just my heart, God, that I want every one of us to have settled the question and been born again, but also that we are staying right with you. That it's not that just we got saved on that day back years ago, but that we are constantly daily walking with Jesus so that when we leave this earth, when we leave behind our mortal bodies, we know that we're going to be going home. So help us, God, to take all of the sin, all of the fears, all the worries that are weighing us down and, and just deal with them in our hearts so that we can be sure, so we can be certain, God, that we are right with you. In the name of Jesus, amen.